Now, it's kind of part of a, a bigger prayer, but it was that section. I think it can come up on the slide if that's okay. And I can remember going back to, they, call them, they don't call them rooms in a monastery, they call them cells. And they are, to be fair, quite similar to a cell. They have a bed and a desk, and that's, and that's it. And I can remember going back to my cell that evening. I'm going to call it a room from now on because it sounds a bit odd. And I can just remember thinking about these words, and I can remember thinking about this whole thing that we have sinned against you. And I can remember, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to big myself up too much, but I'm, I'm quite good with the Bible. And I quite understood kind of the mechanics of the theology behind grace and sinning and your redemption and justification and sanctity. You know, all the big words, I'm like, yeah, 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 I got that, I got that. And I can remember thinking, but I don't really feel like I'm experiencing much grace in my life at the moment. And I can remember just being drawn towards, on the, on the, sev- on, on the, 19th, of, on the 19th of August, 2014, there was a moment that kind of transformed my life a little bit. And I'd ended up in a situation, definitely inflicted by myself, where I was on my way to do something that would have severely altered my life and the life of another person. And I can remember, where I was on this, this long country road, and I can remember seeing this yellow and blue kind of tinge in behind me. And if you're on a lot of substances and quite drunk, and you're walking down a rural road, and you see yellow and blue tinge, you kind of get a sense of what's coming up behind you. I was then arrested, and I was then put in a cell, and I was actually, the the reality is I probably should have got a fairly significant amount of time for what I was caught with at that time. But I can remember in that moment thinking, God, where are you? God, you surely can't save me from this thing. Surely, like, I've put a seal over my life to seal it off to to this stuff. God, this this is like my bloodline. This is like what I come from. Surely this is, this is like my portion. Surely this is what I should have. And I can remember then the Christmas of that year, being in here and then having kind of a real redemptive moment with Jesus and really feeling that pure grace, that pure grace of God. It says in, in Romans 5, I think we'll have that back up on the screen, please. It says, now the law came in to increase the trespass, which effectively means... God brought the law into the world to reveal our sin to us. But where the sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now I can remember in that Christmas and that time going forward, it was like a roller coaster. And grace was just picking me up and picking me up and picking me up and moving me on to new things. And to be honest with you, for about 18 months to a year, until I ended up in my first year of Bible college, it more or less was like that. It was like, oh... There's this kid, he's coming through, he's a, he's a good communicator, he's leading the youth, he's been on missionaries, he's off to Bible college. Oh, he's, he's got all the, all the hallmarks on him to be, something, to be something great. And then something happened in my first year of Bible college. I was actually called to preach for somewhere. And it was about two weeks after my best friend had taken his own life. And I can remember being about two-thirds of the way through my preach, and I just got off the stage. I just said... I literally said, worship team, can you come back up? I've I've had enough. And I got back down, and I sat down, and I can remember in that moment, and then in my room later on that evening at Bible College going, God, this isn't for me. I'm not doing this anymore. This stuff that you might have laid out for me, that's not for me. I'm going to pursue pursue business, and I'm going to pursue money, and I'm going to try and help set Lid up so that Lid can go and do all that she can do in ministry. And in that moment, I'd realized that I'd effectively fallen into this incredible sin called disobedience. And I probably lived until January of this year in this, in just this eternal place of disobedience of, yeah, God, that's great, but that's not for me. Yeah, God, Lick can do that. Yeah, that's great for the church. I'm not getting involved. I'll do all the behind the scenes stuff and, and all of that, but that's not for me. And as I, was, as I was reading in my, in my cell in the monastery that night, I had this revelation of, of the grace abounds. Now, the grace only abounds if you recognize the sin. See, there's a point where, actually, in our Christianity, we fall into this place of like, and I did fully, of I understand the mechanics of being saved. 
I know that I am saved and I understand the mechanics as to how it's got there. I understand the theology deeply. I can take you to every single place in the Bible that tells me I am saved. But it's cheap. Another book that I was reading while I was there is a book called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Has anyone read it? For me, it's probably, besides the Bible, one of the greatest books I've ever read. And he talks about this notion, we're going to skip a few slides along here, talks about this notion of cheap and costly grace and how there's a difference. And you see, the, the place that I'd been living in was this place of cheap grace. This grace that is offered without any cost or change in a person's life. Now, I'm not saying that you're not saved if you live in that place. The reality is that you are. The mechanics of theology, the mechanics of how God has set this thing out, means that through faith you are saved and you will have eternal life in heaven. That's just, that's it. But that's just cheap. So there's a difference between kind of what what we can really walk into and what we can just get. You see, in the costly grace, there's a grace that requires a deep commitment to follow Jesus, involving personal sacrifice and transformation. In Luke 15, verse 7, I believe it is, if we could have the slide up. It talks about, just so I tell you, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. See, in that acknowledgement of my own sin, I was worshipping. I had this thing and I was like, I, to be honest with you, I actually struggle with kind of musical worship. It doesn't really fit me. It doesn't really fit my personality. But, you know, I, I, I'm here every Sunday and I, I attempt to sing my songs. Do you know what I mean? But we do that because we want heaven to rejoice, No. And I thought, hold on, what about if the repentance of my sin is bringing rejoice in heaven? Actually, in that story, Jesus is talking about there's a Pharisee and there's a tax collector. The Pharisee zooms up the stairs. He goes straight up to the temple with kind of no if, buts, or maybe. And he's like, I'm, I belong here. And the tax collector falls on his knees at the steps outside of the temple and he just repents. That's actually a different verse. I do apologise. That's, that's, um, that's the sheep, the lost sheep. But we'll get to that. But, but the tax collector is just on his knees and, God, and Jesus says, that's the one. It's the one that's on his knees, the one that's repenting, the one that's attempting to turn away from the life that was there before that the heavens are rejoicing about. I know sometimes we can feel in life like there's a bit of a gap between where we are and where we're trying to be. Does anyone feel that? I do. Big time. And sometimes it can feel like a bit of a, a, bit of a drag, a bit of a long journey to get there. And I'd just like to, to almost offer this morning that one of, the, one of the first places that you can start is by confronting your own sin. Confessions like a really important thing in the Bible. It might not always seem it, but like confession is a biggie. We're called to confess our sins and repent. Now, within the mechanics of salvation, you, it could be argued that you don't technically have to do that. Technically, just by faith, you can come to God and have eternal life. But there is a place for confession and for repentance. And again, it was in in my cell that night, in my room at the monastery that night that I thought, I genuinely cannot remember the last time I confessed. I cannot remember the last time I actually sat down with God and either in my heart or with words said, God, this is my sin. This is what I'm doing wrong. I'm sorry. And I'm going to actually try and turn away from that. Because a lot of the time within kind of being a Christian, we fall into this space of like, and I've done it, I'm not talking as if it's like a you thing, like this is a me thing. I turn up to church. I probably outserve most people at church. I, I attend all the things I need to attend. I understand my Bible well. 
But I'm not actually trying to turn away from anything and turn towards God. All I'm doing is continuing in almost the Christendom that we have created. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he talks about this interesting, this interesting thing that happens in Luke 18, verse, verse 18 to 31. And it's the story of the rich young ruler. And I probably empathize with the rich young ruler a lot because he turns to Jesus and he says, good God, basically, I've got a question. Jesus says, why would you call me good? You don't call your teachers good. You only call God good. And, he, and the young ruler says, what do I need to do to get into heaven? And that's a little bit like me, like, what do I need to do to get into heaven? I've basically done it all. And Jesus says, well, have you upheld the commandments? And the young ruler's like, yeah, of course I have. I'm a good Jew. Of course I have. In the same way that I could be and we could be, yeah, I'm a good Christian. I've upheld all the stuff that you want me to do. I give money to charity. I try and do missions work. I try and serve in the church. I support people in the church. Yeah, of course I'm there. And Jesus turns around to the rich young ruler and he says, I want you to sell everything and come and follow me. And the rich young ruler isn't able to do that. It says that he looks downcast and he walks away. And the interesting thing is that in the next chapter, Zacchaeus is there and Zacchaeus comes running up to Jesus. And he says, Jesus, Jesus, I've sold half of my possessions. I'm going to come and follow you now. And Jesus said, why did you do that? You did too much. Because to the rich young ruler, what wasn't trying to be said was, I need you to be poor. But Jesus was saying to the rich young ruler, this is the thing I need you to turn away from and I need you to turn towards me. Because yes, you are upholding the law. Yes, you are a good Jew, all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you need to turn away from something to follow me. We look at all the disciples, and when Jesus, Jesus is effectively his first interaction with them is, you over there, come follow me. And they turn away instantly, and they follow, they follow Jesus. And there's often a place, and I've been in that place, where we start to lack turning away. You see, I, I mentioned that story of 10 years ago, because turning away was really easy then. It's like, Barney, just be a good person. <laughs> Stop doing drugs, stop drinking, stop basically involving yourself in crime, get away from the wrong people. That's all easy stuff to do. Well, it's not easy, but it's easy to see. You know, when we've been down the road as a Christian a few more years, suddenly that sin starts to look a little bit murky. Suddenly it starts to look like we've got our lives all together. You could look at me and Lynn and say, do you know what, those two, yeah, good good, solid Christian couple. They do their stuff in church. They've got their lives together. But the reality is, and Paul says this, and Paul talks about this so much in the Bible, is that we are sinful and we will forever be sinful. The reality is you are never able to get away from your sinful nature. We are able, able to be saved from it, and we're able to do all that we can do to go against it and be good, but we will never get away from being sinful. And I almost think like that's what, that's what Jesus is saying to that rich young ruler in that moment, is that actually, you think you've got it all together. You think you're there, like we do. We think we're there. We think that we've like, got our salvation tied up. And it's like, what have you forgot? Have you forgotten that you're sinful? Have you forgotten that repentance is still needed? Have you forgotten that there's something still to turn away from? Because that's been my journey for the last kind of eight months. Is like, okay then, Barney, what, what does it mean to, to turn away from disobedience? And what does it look like to turn towards obedience? How do we do that? How do we navigate that? Jesus, help me. That's when we start to experience the Holy Spirit within us, helping to transform us. But this abounding grace doesn't exist when we do not accept that we are sinful, when we start to notice our sin in ourselves. If we stop noticing the sin in ourselves, what's the point in the gospel? The gospel only came around for one reason, and that was because we could not fulfill the law. God, in his wisdom, brought the law through Moses 
first five books of the Bible to tell us how to live, effectively to tell us how to live in order to gain eternal life. And we can't do it. There's only ever been one man that's been able to do it, Jesus Christ, the unblemished lamb. He was able to do it, but we are unable to do it. All of humanity is unable to do it. It is only by this abounding grace that we are even able to interact with the God of our universe. It's that abounding grace that takes us from our lives going in one direction and helping us to be able to turn away and go in another direction, a direction that follows Jesus, a direction that is truly discipleship. Because what do all those disciples have in common? They all turn away from their life that was before and they turn towards a life following Jesus. And I wonder this morning if even in yourself, as I'm saying this, you're thinking, oh, Barney, I don't, I don't know. There's some stuff in my life that just seems probably a little bit too big. It probably seems like, actually, I'm not sure if God can deal with that. Well, there's a verse in Romans 8, and it's verse 1. And it talks about how there is no condemnation anymore in Christ. Condemnation quite literally refers to being guilty. And the reality is that when we are in Christ Jesus, there is nothing that we can be or have been or will be guilty of anymore. It is quite literally impossible for us to be guilty of anything in the eyes of God if we are in Christ Jesus. And that can be a weird one to get our head around sometimes because there's all sorts of atrocities that happen in this world. And it's hard to surmise as to like, well, God, how come, how come you love that person? Surely you shouldn't be loving that person. That person's done everything against you. Maybe you even think that of yourself. But the reality is, grace abounds where there is sin. Where there is sin, there is far more grace than that sin could ever know. And there is no condemnation when you're in Christ Jesus. There will never be a guilty verdict against your name as long as you are in Christ Jesus. As long as you are continuing to turn away. As long as you are acknowledging that sin and going, actually, I need grace to help me with this sin because I cannot do this on my own anymore. There will always be grace for you. But something kind of twigged in me and it's like, but that grace, that grace is only there when there is sin. So as soon as I stop as soon as I start forgetting that I'm sinful, I start forgetting that I'm under grace. How am I meant to turn? How am I meant to follow Jesus if I've forgotten what he's done for me? If what he's done for me has become so small, it's become merely just the mechanics of the Bible. It's no longer my salvation. It's just the way I live, my culture, my whatever. Yes, it's what I believe, but is it really what I'm living? Am I really living a life where I'm constantly evaluating, looking at myself and saying, Lord, what do I need to turn away from? What is the sin that is in my life right now that I need to turn away from and start following you on? How do I experience that glorious grace that I met when I was 19 years old in that Christmas when my life looked absolutely, completely different? People come up to me and say, Barney, I'm surprised you're not dead or in prison. And I'm there living, I'm living free. Because the grace has abounded in my situation. There is no longer any condemnation in my life and I've been able to turn away from my life before. But how do we do that now? How do we do that now that we've maybe been down the road six months, a year, 10 years, 30 years, 40 years, 60 years, 70 years, I'm hoping it's in some, 70 years, yeah? How do we do that when, I'm not being funny, that's a long old time. How do we do that when we realize actually we never become sinless? How do we do that when we're 70 years down the line and we down the line and we realize we're still not sinless? I'm still not good enough. It's by realizing that in the sin there's an abundant amount of grace out there for us. An abundant amount of grace out there for us.
Now, in a bit, we're going to... I don't even know how I'm doing for time. And I forgot to start my stopwatch, didn't I? It's mine and Liz. We both do it whenever we preach. Forget to start the stopwatch. You've got absolutely no idea. But in a minute, we're going we're gonna to be taking communion later. And I wonder if we can, like those, like those Franciscan monks, have a, have a time of silence. And this isn't going to be silence with pads on, and it's not going to be silence with a bit of muttering, but it's going to be proper silence. And we're going to sit, and we're going to wait, and we're going to look upon ourselves. And then after that, we're, we're going to take communion. And we're going to effectively say to God, we're going to try to acknowledge to him of like, look, this is what I'm trying to turn away from. I urge you this morning, if you don't think there's anything that you need to turn away from, to check yourself even more. Because that rich young ruler had it all wrong. He thought he was there. He thought he'd done it all. I've been there, I've, I've been there, I've thought I've done it all, I've thought, yeah, do you know what, I've done this Christian thing, I'm doing pretty all right at it, but there's always stuff. My big one was being disobedient, just saying, God, I'm not going to allow you to use me, use anyone else, don't use me. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to start a stopwatch because I finally found it on my iPad. And we're going to have a time and we are, we're just going to sit in silence, maybe with your eyes closed, maybe with your head bowed, maybe with looking up to the ceiling, anything. And it's going to be long and it's going to be awkward and your brain's going to drift. I'll let you know something that happens, sorry, this is completely random. Something happens on the first day of doing a silent retreat when fasting is your body literally starts like buzzing. Like halfway through the first day, you're like buzzing. You've got no sugar in you. You've had no dopamine. There's been nothing. And your body's like, doesn't know even know what to do with itself. So you might even have a little bit of that. Your mind will start spinning, start wandering. In those moments, what I try and do is I try and just say, Lord, I am here. Please talk. So we're going to start some time going to have silence and just reflect within ourselves what maybe is that thing.
don't know if the um the guys doing communion would be able to come up and just take take positions now i don't know whatever it is in your heart that maybe god might have revealed to you but the incredible thing about that is whatever whatever that thing is despite that thing God still loved you so much. You might know this, you might not know this, but God still loved you so much that he sent his own son to die a horrific death on the cross so that you could be freed from that thing and that you could turn away from that thing, whatever that is. His body was like the the, the lamb with no blemish that was sent to the slaughter. And the blood of Jesus Christ is kind of the the catalyst of what sets us free. So in a second, if if you feel it's right with you, then we're going to take communion together. Again, we're going to do it in silence. And just as we take communion, let's just reflect on what is that thing for us to turn from? What is that thing that despite whatever it is, Jesus literally gave his body and bled his blood so that we could live in this, uh, uh, this grace that abounds. That we could live in this place that no matter what we do, as long as we keep coming back to him, as long as we keep confessing our sin and attempting to turn away from it, he will keep us. So if you'd just like to come and take communion now, if you feel that is right for you.